special program on the history of the early school of Canal, and that's particularly appropriate because George was a student at all of those schools. No. And, <laughs> Not all of them. and so George knows from firsthand he thinks experience so. Uh, what went on at all of those schools. So without uh, further meandering and kidding from me, uh, it's my pleasure to present George Vincent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like, uh, I see a, a number of faces of uh, people that know more about the school, of, the old school on the Hills history than I do, of which this is a wonderful picture. This is going to be on the cover of my book. This is Francis Alahorse here. Probably taken in 19, uh, painted in the 1930s, but it's a gorgeous picture, one of the few in color that I've seen. But how many of you went to the old school in the hill? How many alumni? Ah, oh, God bless you. You all have wonderful memories of bad times. <laughs> that cake might be the best thing you've had all evening, so just, I just want to warn you about that. But uh, I just, uh, my background, as I said, I worked there for four years as custodian. Um, if I'm just going to touch on the schools in Pinot, the three schools, each one kind of depended upon the other one as they evolved. Um, you need to read the book to find out all the uh, wonderful details. It's fully illustrated. Um, as I said, I've spent a lot of time researching as much as I can find. I've had a lot of help from Stella Freya, from Celeste, from uh, those in the families that, uh, who went to the school and had uh, great memories of the school. My mom was a teacher for many, many years there as well, a second grade teacher. Um, just wanted to show you a couple of things before I start. We collect artifacts. We don't have a museum. My garage, his garage, everyone's <laughs> garage, whole things. But the Collins family uh, donated these things to us. And this is uh, from Edward Downer. This is the Educational Week trophy from 1929. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the activities at the old school tonight. But uh, this was in Miss Collins' garage when she passed away, Margaret Collins. And uh, they were nice enough to find it uh, rusting in the garage and uh, donate it to us. So this was donated by the Downer family, who were benefactors of the school and uh, on the school board. Uh, also, this little thing, this is the uh, Spinole Hercules Union School District School Board gavel that Margaret Collins somehow kept. And uh, now it belongs to Spinole. Historical Society of the Community of Pinal. So these are the kind of things we like to collect, pictures, artifacts, anything that contributes to our history. Um, if you read the first book we had on Pinal, Pinal uh, that was uh, published, uh, well, how many years ago is it? 2009. 2009, how many books have we sold so far? Almost 950. About 950 books. And that's just us. That doesn't include Barnes and & Noble and other retail yeah. That was probably the most comprehensive book that we published with pictures and history. But one of the things in there was that early Pinole from 1900 through the probably 1950s, there was a pattern of life in Pinole. You have to understand the pattern of life to understand how important the schools were in that pattern of life in Pinole. You were born in Pinole. Dr. Manuel Fernandez brought you into the world, usually. Uh, I have the slip at home that uh, <laughs> when I was born, a hospital. Uh, delivery and hospital, 40 bucks. Now, <laughs> I won't tell you when that was, but it was $40. So Dr. Manuel Fernandez usually brought you into the world, and then in the community of Pinal, you went to Pinal Hercules School number one. Or you might have gone to one of the earlier schools, but uh, most people went to this school that are still around today. And that's where you met your childhood sweetheart, at the school. And usually in the neighborhood also, because everyone knew everyone in the neighborhoods. The neighborhoods were small. And uh, it was a multicultural community. Families all got along. Didn't matter what your religion was. Didn't matter what your background was. And everyone looked forward to the Pinole uh, Portuguese Holy Ghost Parade. And uh, everyone looked forward to all kinds of activities from different ethnic groups. But you went to the Pinole Hercules School in the Hill. You met your sweetheart. And then as you got older and it was time for you to work, you worked at uh, the California Powder Works or the Hercules Powder Company. My dad, my mother worked at the Hercules Powder Company in 1918 loading artillery shells during World War I to help her through school. Uh, my father worked at the Union Oil, pardon me, at the uh, Hercules Powder Company and then he worked uh, 40 years at the Union Oil Company. So that was a pattern of life. Dr. Manuel Fernandez brought you into the world. 
You went to the Pinole Hercules School, you met your sweetheart there, you got married, uh, usually in the Catholic Church in Pinole or the Methodist Church, that's where you were married. And um, then in your declining years, Charlie Ryan, the little undertaker from <laughs> Richmond, would drive around Pinole and kind of wink at the guys sitting on the benches. And so that was a cycle of life in Pinole. But this school was a very important part of that. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself because to understand this school, you have to understand the schools that came before this in Pinole. And um, the schools in Pinole grew out of what were called, in Contra Costa County, grew out of what were called family schools. Today you would probably call them um, where uh, a family hires a teacher or a tutor in the home, homeschooling I guess they call it. And everyone uh, that was interested in having their child in school would go to that family school. Now there were no school buildings in Contra Costa County. Uh, it wasn't until the 1860s, about 1866, 69, that the schools really became starting to be built in Contra Costa County. And they were usually one room wooden schools, dilapidated buildings, hot in the summer and cold in the winter, and very small and cramped and poorly furnished also. <laughs> so what you had at that time were the family schools and then eventually, in the mid-1860s, uh, you had more and more Americans coming into California. Uh, by that time, the uh, ranchos were gone, and Pinole, El Rancho Pinole was gone, and most of the ranchos in the area uh, were all so become Americanized. The Americans had come in and taken over most of the land. So you had this interest in public education, or Yankee education. The Yankees wanted their kids to be educated. Um, of interest, as the schools evolved, uh, if you did not, kids 8 through 14 had to attend school in the 1860s. If you did not attend uh, school, your family was uh, fined $5, which was a lot of money in those days, per child, or 10 days in jail. So it was pretty serious if you didn't send your kids to school. But the family schools eventually evolved into uh, other schools. And what's of, of interest is Pinole's got the oldest name in Contra Costa County. The oldest name. And from my research, I've discovered that I think Pinole had the first oldest school in Contra Costa County also. <laughs> and I don't think it's been uh, discovered uh, until recently because from the evidence I've gathered, probably the first school in Pinole was uh, built around 1864 in Pinole. Uh, and we'll see some evidence of that in a moment. So if you want to... Now, <clears throat> this is the only school, the only picture we have of the first school, and it's called the Fitzgerald School. Um, it was probably, this, is, this picture was taken in the 1950s. Interestingly enough, of Pinole's three oldest schools, this one lasted long, the longest of all three. Now, where was this school and what was it? Well, first of all, it was a farm building that was pressed into service as a school building. And this school was located probably pretty close to um, today where Pinole Middle School is, maybe a little further down toward the freeway. And this ranch area was owned by the Fitzgerald family, which is a name familiar to you because of the you know, Fitzgeralds in 1965s sold their holdings and uh, today Pinole enjoys the tax benefits. <laughs> so this was a one room wooden school. Uh, it was pressed into service, a farm building pressed into service as a school. We've never found any pictures of the school that were taken except this one. This was taken by a man named Lee Friedell when he wrote a book called The Story of Richmond in, in the 1950s. He came through Pinole looking for evidence of uh, talking to old timers and looking for evidence in pictures. And he found this still standing. The school had been moved by that time to another, par to another farm building. But this is the... Uh, Fitzgerald School, and it was located about a mile, a little over a mile up from San Pablo Avenue. Uh, is the other map, Jeff? Towards the valley? Uh, yes. Yeah. Now, I found this map. <laughs> there you go. I found this map in the County Historical Society, and it shows the old Pinole School. This is 1968. And it was called the Old Pinole School in 1968. So be, being called the Old Pinole School, it means it had to be built before that time. The first evidence we have of the school is uh, 
in the uh, paper in 1865, 1866, when they're calling for repairs on the old schoolhouse uh, and to also pay, find money to pay the teacher. They were trying to float school bonds, which they did, $250. So in 1865 and 1866, that's the first recorded time when this school uh, makes the newspapers. So my feeling is that it probably was built in around 1864. But this is on the Fitzgerald Ranch property. Here you see uh, San Pablo Dam Road. This is O'Brien Saloon on the corner in Panol. <laughs> These are all saloons here, by the way, all four. And then this is the road to San Pablo Creek. So this was a Fitzgerald property. Probably the freeways are right about here today, I would think, right in here. And the school, by the way, was um, a one-room wooden school. Uh, just to tell you a few facts about the school, the, um, the teachers at the school were usually uh, men. The first teachers I've uh, discovered were men. And uh, you had uh, a number of different uh, gentlemen who were uh, teachers at the school. Um, you had, um, well, Mr. Flint in, seven, in 1876. Now, Mr. Flint was uh, a teacher at the old, uh, what I call the Fitzgerald School. And by the way, the Fitzgeralds were proponents of education. So I think that's why they started education here in Pinole. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald served on the school board, and his children were honor roll students uh, at the old Fitzgerald School. It must have been a very crowded school, there were the first recorded number of kids where there were 73 white children and three Indian children in 1866 that went to the school. Now, Mr. Flint was the uh, teacher in, in 1876, and he was fired. Why was he fired? Because he used one of those huge oak wooden pointers to beat the daylights out of a 15-year-old who had misbehaved. And the boy was considerably bruised badly, and the parents sued, and uh, so he lost his job. Um, in 1880, Clarence White was the teacher. And uh, Clarence White, one of his uh, students, was uh, Annie Tennant of the Tennant family in Pinole. She was 15 at the time. I might mention that the children that went to the school was from first grade through eighth grade, but some of the eighth graders were 15, 16 years old. I mean, uh, <laughs> in the old Pinole school, they had uh, standards. And the overriding standard was uh, no child left behind. Well, you were left behind. If you didn't pass test, you were left behind. I've found re school registers where in the third, second and third grade, there are kids as old as 12 years old, and in the fifth grade, as old as 14, 15, and 16. Okay, so uh, you, you really had to work hard and uh, had take really rigorous tests to pass on to the next grade level. But anyway, uh, we can see the next picture. Um, most, of, most families, be, this is before the wooden school, uh, Fitzgerald School was built, most families that had, that, um, had their children go to um, family schools, those were ones that were kind of middle class or poor ranchers. The ones who had wealth and money, those people sent their kids to school elsewhere. Jose Martinez of El Rancho Pinol, he brought a teacher all the way over from Spain to educate his children in Pinole Valley. Um, Frances Ellahorse, at the age of six or seven, was sent by her parents in Pinole to live with her grandmother to, send, to go to a boarding school in San Francisco. Uh, Bernardo Fernandez, his two daughters, uh, Mamie or Mary and Anita, they were both sent to boarding schools in San Francisco as well. So if you were kind of the elite in Pinole, you sent your kids elsewhere to be educated. But then, very interestingly enough, Bernardo Fernandez, Pinole's leading citizen, in, in 18, uh, I think it was 1884, um, yes, no, 1880, his, his, uh, 1884, his son Manuel, who had become Pinole's um, foremost beloved doctor, was going to the Fitzgerald School and was a graduate and an honor student. So this is Frances Ellahorse, and uh, she became Pinole's prominent, most prominent educator, um, and she, I'll talk about her in the book uh, quite a bit also, she and her family. Her sister Alice also became a teacher in Pinole. Now this is Mary Kelly, 
She was the first female teacher in Panola. I think after Mr. Flint was fired because of his uh, anger outburst with the pointer, um, she was the first female teacher in 18, uh, I believe, 1884. Jim, see the next one. This is Anna Tennant or Annie Tennant. Now, she was in um, Mrs. Miss, uh, Miss Mary Kelly's class in 1884, and she was about 15 years old then. This is uh, Anna when she was about six. Her mom was Rafaela Martinez Tennant. Now, her mother passed away in 1868, but her mother had inherited all of uh, the Martinez Ranch holdings that included from where we are here today all the way down to the bay. And so the tenants uh, owned all of that land. And so <clears throat> uh, Anna Tennant uh, went to the Fitzgerald School she rode her horse Caribou, her favorite horse, there every day. The kids had to walk, by the way, or they had to go by buggy and horse to get to the school. And in wintertime, it was very hard to get there. So uh, this was Anna Tennant, and even when her leg was broken, she rode her horse to school at that time. Her mother uh, did pass away in 1868, and Anna was the uh, smallest uh, youngest daughter. Well, what happened was with the Panola Pl uh, Fitzgerald School, was it became too small. Uh, Panol was getting much bigger, and so they needed another school. They needed another school badly. So what happened was, in 1886, her Aunt Anna Tennant's father, uh, Samuel Tennant, donated all of the land around the post office today and around St. Joseph's School, uh, donated that land to the city of Panol for a school because the... Um, Fitzgerald School had uh, outgrown its, uh, its limits. It was a one-room uh, farm building school, and it was just too small now. And so he donated the land in 1886. By the way, previously he had donated the land for St. Joseph's Church also as a, a memorial to his wife because she was very Catholic. So all that land had been donated. Then he donated the plaza land where the uh, city of Panola City Hall is today. That was all donated. And so the Panola Plaza School was built. Now this picture is very interesting. Uh, for a number of reasons. <clears throat> One of them is that it's the only picture we've ever found of the school, just about, where you could see almost all of the school. Now, this school was built in 1886. We have pictures in the book of uh, the first the eight, class of 1889. We have the names of all the students. Yes. Can we go back to the other one, Jeff, just for a minute? I wanted to point out a few things uh, here. <clears throat> this was a one-room school and was built in 1886 and this was added on later when they outgrew the school, when the, the, uh, the school was bursting at the seams with students. And of, of interest is uh, the fact that uh, <clears throat> you see this fence here. This fence was built to divide the two types of uh, kids. On the right side you have what are called the grammar school kids who are of high school age, a lot of them. On the left side were the primary school kids. Now, you see a flagpole in the foreground, and what's interesting about Panol Plaza School was it was a community center as well. The city of Panol held their council meetings there, um, the Methodist Church held their Sunday church meetings there, and Saturday night dances were held there. And so every Saturday night they'd have to unscrew all the desks, uh, you know, from the floor and take them out and then put them back, uh, you know, for the um, minister on um, Sunday, Methodist minister to come there. And, uh, but they, uh, they charged a dollar for a dance, at the dance, or full orchestra, a dollar for all you could eat, all night long, dances at the old school. So this was a community center. And um, the Panol, in 1906, the Panol, Boys Brass Band held their first meeting there. And that's when the Panol Band first started at this school also. So it's very interesting. If you look at the uh, garb of the students, you know, you're always somebody that's got to mess up everything, don't they, coming <laughs> over, over the fence there. This is a beautiful picture. You know, it just uh, was, I guess, some, someone donated, or Louis Stein uh, found it and uh, gave it to the County Historical Society. I was just looking through there, and all, I recognized it right away. 
This flagpole, when the school was uh, torn down, was sent to the, or taken to the uh, Hercules Potter Company and put out in front of the Hercules Potter Company and used as their flagpole. By the way, uh, the people that held the dances were very school-minded. They donated money to the school to buy a flag and to buy that flagpole. So the, the school was really a community treasure, but it was bursting at the seams. There were too many students. Um, I think there were, at one time, um, there were almost 200 students uh, at this school. Where was it know. located? Ah, good question. The school where it was located is, um, some of you might even remember School Street in the 70s. The street that used to run in front of the post office was called School Street. And then it was taken off the maps when that, the building exploded uh, over there across the street. And uh, so school, school Street's not on the maps anymore. But it's where the post office and St. Joseph's School is today. That's where uh, the Plaza School was. And uh, it was a uh, Pinole School from 1886 to 1906. <clears throat> so just a couple of things I want to look at here so I don't uh, forget. Yes, there are 54 girls and 45 boys at this school in the first class in 1886. Grades 1 to 8, Miss Mary McCary and Miss Maggie Willing were the uh, teachers at this school. And here you see it's very unusual for the teachers to take pictures with the kids. But here is, uh, here she is, up here, Mary McCary, 1889. We have the names of all the children. Here's one of the Ellahorse girls. That's Dora Ellahorse there. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the Plaza School, uh, Alice Ellahorse was one of the students there in 1893. In 1897, she returned and became a teacher there. Now, that was before her sister, Frances, became principal, too. You could become a teacher if you were 16 years old, if you're a woman, 17 if you're a man. Um, of interest is uh, the picture you saw of Mary Kelly. She made about $65 a month. Uh, on the average, female teachers made $61 a month, male teachers about $95 a month. Uh, I know, I know. But that's, that's the way it was back there. So this is unusual because the teacher is in this photo at this time. Did they have, uh, excuse me, did they kids are all different ages. Yes. There's one teacher. Yes. How did she teach, a, you know, an eight-year-old along with a 16-year-old when there's different levels teaching like we have now? Well, give, just to give you an idea, Alice Ellahorse, when she, she uh, came back to teach at this school, she had 55 kids in the first grade. First grade. First grade. Well, were they in the same classroom? And there were combinations, too. And there might be kids that in the first grade that are 10 years old. You know, they didn't pass. You had to pass a rigorous exam given by the county of uh, Contra Costa County to go from one grade level to another. Of every subject imaginable, I have it in my book. I have the actual tests in my the book. Grade levels mixed is what I'm saying. Yes, some of them were, yes. You have, like, in combination classes, seventh and eighth. Um, the grammar school classes were preparing the kid, uh, for, for college, the ones that wanted to go to college. So I had 15 and 16-year-olds there. Uh, this is Alice Ellahorse, as I mentioned. This is Frances Ellahorse's uh, younger sister. She was a Plaza School graduate. Now, in um, 1900, there was a population boom because Pinole was growing like crazy with the Hercules Potter Company, California Potter Works, and Pinole was, was just booming. So there were 168 kids going to this one-room school in 1900. And there were only two teachers, Alice Ellahorse and um, a teacher named Miss Blanchard. So they only had two teachers, 168 kids, all different ages and grade levels at the time. So it was pretty tough at that time. Um, I just want to mention that in uh, 1893, the honor roll in 1893 were some of the pioneer families in Pinal. You had uh, Annie, Emma, and Alice Ellahorse, Anastasia Dean, Mary Oliver, Minnie Silva, and Mabel Frazier, just a few. So the honor rolls were pu published in the newspapers, uh, Pinal Hercules Times. And so uh, everybody was looked forward to that. One thing that uh, started at this school also that was very interesting was what was called the half holiday. If you got 80 to 90 percent in your studies for a whole month and were never late to school and your deportment, which means your behavior was good, you got a half day off each month. I mean, this was, this was fantastic for, 
for kids, you know, you got a half day off from school back then, and your name was printed in the paper, your parents were proud of you. It was a great deal, a great thing. Uh, it was carried on at the old school in Panola also, and was dropped in the 1920s uh, for some reason, maybe because of uh, the Depression later on. I don't know the reason. But that was started, the half holiday was started at the old school in Panola. A couple of facts here. Um, in, 19, in 1901, this lady, Frances Ellahorse, came to be the teaching principal at the Plaza School. Now, this is an unusual photo. Uh, one reason is that you can see the outhouse here. <laughs> see, when you see these schools, so that's one of the things you usually don't see, but they had to have them. And uh, there's the air conditioning, the window open here, <laughs> as you can see. If you went to the old school in Pinole, you know how hot that school got, how, how terribly hot those, those rooms were. But uh, this is Frances Ellahorse, and she came uh, as a, a teaching principal in 1901 to 1906 until she transferred to the old school on the hill in Pinole. Now, uh, she had a very interesting uh, career, a long career. Uh, here she's in her 20s. She started teaching at the, in the Sheldon School District. And I might mention that um, the Pinole Hercules School District, uh, Pinole School District started in uh, <clears throat> 1865, 1866. The Pinole Hercules School District was born in 1904. Hercules had their own school district in 1903, but then they formed with Pinole later on because it was more advantageous um, for a lot of reasons. Economically, uh, the cities of Pinole and Hercules were kind of twin cities. Each one interdependent upon the other. Most people worked at Hercules, went to school in Pinole. So the, the Hercules Potter Company was a great benefactor of the Pinole schools. But anyway, there's my Aunt Elsie. This was, this was taken in 1905, 1904, pardon me. So that's my Aunt Elsie there. And notice, notice how big these kids are. I mean, look at the different sizes of the children there. This is probably the grammar school <laughs> class, I would think, the older kids. But look at this lady right here. That's Lizzie Stewart, Elizabeth Stewart. Oh my God. Yeah. And uh, she taught for uh, many, many years in Pinole. Uh, she came each day on the train for Martinez to Pinole. She taught over 40 years in the Pinole School District. And then uh, she retired in 1944 with her third grade class in 1944. But that's Lizzie Stewart. And uh, I don't know why she's there, because she wasn't one of the teachers there then. But she later on would be. I, this, this might be her first teaching year. I'm sorry. It might be her first teaching year at the school. I don't know who these other wonderful looking people are here. They're very serious looking, aren't they? Uh, you can see. Now here we are at, at uh, your alma mater, Pinole Hercules School number one. Now, a little bit about the prehistory. Um, first of all, looking at this school, this is a picture taken looking west. And what's nice about it is you can see here the water tower. You have to have water. And uh, they didn't have a, a piping system to pipe in water at the time. Um, you can see here, this is not a flagpole. It looks like it. In some pictures, you see a flag flying from there. That's probably a lightning rod more than anything else. Uh, the school bell is in here. And um, just to give you some facts about this uh, school, and that some of the trees are growing here, looking west. Um, <clears throat> the California Potter Works bought the land for the school. And they bought it from the Yellow Horse family. The Yellow Horse owned all the land. If you go to downtown Pinole today, those of you who don't know Pinole very well, and you look east, you see all those eucalyptus trees rising off Pinole Valley Road as you go toward San Pablo Avenue. Those are descendants of the first trees that were planted by students that went to Pinole Hercules School Number One. Now it's called Pinole Hercules School Number One. It was also called the Hill School because it was on top of Samuel Street, um, and it was also called the Green School because it was painted a light green color. Here, and just to give you some facts about the school, um, the Hercules Potter Company selected the site because it was between Pinole and Hercules. Kids from Hercules could walk to the school easily. Kids from Pinole could walk to the school easily. And this bell could be heard all over Pinole and Hercules when it was rung. And if you're late coming up the hill, there was a tardy bell also. God help you. 
you know, back then. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, why, why kids took their rosary beads and St. Christopher medals to school with them sometimes, <laughs> especially if you're Mrs. Beaver's class. <laughs> anyway, uh, in September 1905, the Hercules Potter Company started grading the school, and one of the uh, graduates that graded the school was uh, Henry Ellahorse. Ellahor Henry Avenue is named after here. The Ellahorse family, they owned all that property where um, Linda Heights is today named after the Ellahorse girls, Alice Way and blah blah and Francis Way and so forth. Uh, they have Francis's name spelled wrong. Right, she doesn't come out. Sometime they have her name spelled C I S instead of C E S on the uh, street. Dora, yes, yeah, Dora. Dora was in one of the pictures there. Um, in October, the brick foundation was laid. So in September, they started grading the site. In October, a brick foundation was laid. And let's see, in January, the first coat of light green paint was put on the school. That's why I got its nickname, the, you know, the green school sometimes. And then, in March of 1906, the school bell, the iron school bell, was hung. Now, that's the only thing we have remaining that's been saved of the old school, besides a lot of memories, some pictures. And if you're interested, sometime the bell has been restored. Uh, the Panola Historical Society, uh, with Jeff Rubin uh, doing the footwork, uh, we have the bell restored. It's hanging at uh, Collins School. And there's a plaque there that I'll read some of the information, or some of the wording on the plaque for you. Toward the end. It's really not hanging. It's not hanging, it's sitting. Right. <laughs> but it still has that one hell of a gong to it, you know. And you could, uh, old timers said you could hear that bell ring all over town, and you better not be late. And sometimes the kids got to pull the bell if they got there early, but not too often. That was not their job. Um, just a little bit about the school. I want to read to you what it said in the paper. You know, I was surprised this school was one of the biggest schools in the whole county, and one of the most beautiful schools in the whole county. It's pictured decorated postcards of the time in color, and um, the citizens of Pinole were so proud of their school, it was just a, one of the biggest, bettest, best schools in the whole county, and Pinole was so proud of it. But I can't find any record of when they had a dedication. They must have had a dedication and a walkthrough. I've looked through countless newspapers, can't find it. So maybe someday we will. But this, this is what the school board, they passed bonds, and they said uh, in May 1905 in the newspaper, we need a new school badly, vote yes for school bonds, which they did. And so this is what they wanted. They said the building is to be one story with a basement to contain five classrooms, each 24 by 32 and modern in all respects, entire building not to exceed $10,000. Big money back then. <laughs> well, what happened? Of course, we know what happened. Uh, it was, school was ready to go in March of 1906, and in April, the great San Francisco earthquake came. And so the school's opening was delayed. And probably not just the earthquake, there was a huge scarlet fever epidemic in the Martinez schools at that time that had taken a number of lives of students. So. I think that might have had something to do with opening of the school also. They wanted to make sure that you know, there was no uh, disease at the school for the students. Um, interesting enough, there was originally six classrooms. Each classroom had a Seth Thomas clock. And uh, some of them are still, a couple of them are still uh, working today. And if you uh, buy the book, you'll see a picture of one of the clocks in there. Um, just to give you an idea of what happened uh, elsewhere, in 1917, uh, a new room was added and the assembly hall. Those of you that mem remember graduating in the assembly hall or going to the assembly hall for Ms. Ms. Martin's hearing Miss Martin's orchestra to play, at least you thought it was playing the Star Spangled Banner uh, at the time. Um, interesting enough, in 1919, uh, Jeff, before you go on, in 1919, the school added a manual training department. They added another room and what was called a domestic science department. And so for seventh and eighth grade boys, they had manual arts training. They had uh, wooden, oak wooden benches. They hired a carpenter to teach the boys how to do, uh, make wooden, they made wooden toys. They made uh, uh, breadboards and birdhouses for their parents and things. 
and uh, it, was, it was a wonderful time. And the girls had a domestic science, and they had learned all the arts of uh, homemaking and uh, sewing. And they made their own clothes and clothes uh, for friends, and they would, uh, at the end of the year, they would display all the wonderful things that they made at that time. And that was discontinued during probably the Depression in the 30s. But that was an innovation at this school at that time, too. Um, in 1946, the last class room was added to the back of the school. And by the way, this is where the domestic science building would be, right here in the east. If you go here, that's Linda Heights today, just going out this way. And the domestic science was behind, or pardon me, the um, 1946, the last building was, was added back there. It was a first grade class, and uh, I was in that class, Miss Lenny's class. Anyone else in Miss Lenny's class here? Nobody else goes back that far? OK. <laughs> um, well, who were the teachers there? Well, the principal was Frances Ellahorse. Elizabeth Stewart was one of the teachers at that time. Ruby Fuller was a teacher. And Alice Ellahorse. There were four teachers that went from the old Plaza School to this school. Now, this shows you um, a map of the Pinole Hercules Union School District. It's the Pinal Hercules Union School District. Now, the Sheldon School District was over here. The two earliest school districts in the county were the Martinez School District and the San Pablo School District, because those were the two largest cities, San Pablo and Martinez. And notice Pinal was kind of in between those, and the stage line went from Martinez down San Pablo Avenue through Pinal into San Pablo, and then from San Pablo this way into Oakland at that time. So these are the boundaries of the Paul Hercules Union School District, as you can see there. Um, one thing I want to mention, uh, Jeff, you go back to the school just for a moment. The, um, the outhouses were here. And they were very big. And they planted pepper trees over them. And descendants of those pepper trees are still there today. And I, I have to mention now, that in 1906 or 1907, there was an Arbor Day project. And all the students planted their trees around the school, here and here. Their descendants you can still see today in downtown Pinole. Now, many of the students still remember their tree, Mary Agnes Rose. Remembers, doesn't she? Didn't she? Her mother, uh, Stella Freya's mother-in-law, remembered where she planted her tree. My mom remembered where she planted her tree. Each of the kids remembered where they planted their trees. The, the trees were donated by the Hercules Potter Company, and they had another purpose, too, beside beautification, to surround the school and protect it from the concussions of the Hercules Potter Company when it blew up. So the, the windows would get blown out. Yeah. yeah, they do blow down quite easily. Yeah. yeah, If you look now, the people who live along Pinot Valley Road, those trees kind of just loom over their homes. I wonder if that affects the value, but yeah, that, uh, if they know I, it's I historical. That was a big event. In, that was a big fear. Those eucalyptus trees were, were yeah. so big. <laughs> they had grown so big. They did. And they took them down because they were, uh, I don't know what year that was, in 1956. Well, my mother when, uh, lived in Pinole Valley at the time, and she, in 1909, 1910. She and my father both met at the old school on the hill. Um, and my mom uh, rode in a one-horse cart from Pinole uh, out deep in the valley, where I guess the dog park is now around that area. And uh, well, I'm sorry, further out. You know the old ranch that's out there, the Mooring Ranch? She would come from there. That's where they lived. And they would come every day. They'd park the car horse and cart at the foot of the hill. At noon, they'd take the horse uh, <laughs> hay and oats and water, and then go back in the afternoon after school and take the horse and go back out the cart. I interviewed a lady that was 105 years old that went to the school. Nellie Asplin Medina Nichols. She came from England in 1910 to Pinole as a little girl. Lived on Pinion Avenue, Pinion Avenue down off San Pablo Avenue. 
And every morning, she would walk, she and her brother would walk their lard can lunch pails um, along the Santa Fe tracks, all the way down to Tennant Avenue, and they would get off down uh, above the uh, depot, above uh, the bay. They would walk past all the saloons. She remembers all, every saloon. They would walk all the way up to the old school on the hill to try to get there before the bell rang. 105 years old she was. And she had a memory like a uh, solid. Well, what happened? Before, um, oh, yes, I'm sorry. 1907-198 class photo. Now, usually you don't see the teacher in the class photos. But here, if you look, there's the bell uh, rope to ring the bell. That's the school bell rope in the picture there. And uh, Selma Greenstein was one of the uh, pupils who was at the old school, who lived, whose family lived on Samuel Street, just below the schoolhouse, just below the schoolhouse. And she remembered that a warning bell that was rung for kids. You, got to, you had to get up that hill. Now, when I was going to school there in the 50s, there was a teacher, there was the first men, te men teacher were in the 50s, first male teachers. Mr. Kennerly, he was next Marine. You were late getting up that hill, 20 push-ups or duck walks. It was awful to see kids at recess just pathetically trying to do push-ups and duck walks all over the yard. <laughs> that, that was one of the awful punishments. Here is Elizabeth Stewart with her class, combination class, young teacher, Lizzie Stewart. Uh, she was very strict. Uh, some of the, her pupils remember her in class when it was time to go for recess. She would say, rise, Turn, pass, do it again. You're going to do it till you get it right. Rise, turn, pass. Those big, poor kids, huh? The, the, this person was 90 years old. I remember that. Now, I want to, I mean, this is Alice Elahor's first and second grade class list. One of the wonderful things we have are some of the school registers from this time. And I just wanted to. Inter interject a personal note here. These are, this is a roll call of Panol's history in these, re in these registers of the pi pioneers. I'm sorry if I'm getting in your way. Here's Margaret Dean. She became one of the leading educators in Panol, the Dean family. She was a principal at school in Rodale. But let's go down a little further here. I have my glasses on here. Let's see if I can see. Uh, there's Willie Pawsey, Manuel Rose. Down here. Oh, gee whiz. There's Emmett Walton. Oh, there's my dad, George Vincent, in the first and second grade. What do you know? Whoa, there's my mother, Emily Scanley. <laughs> so when I found that, you know, that was really just heart wrenching. And there's my mom and dad were in the same grade. These, this was the first class in the new school in 1906. The school opened in October of 1906, and they were in the first, in Alice Ellerhorst's first and second grade class. Yeah, I, I, I never knew that. But my mom went further on. My dad, he, he had a little trouble passing these tests. They were pretty tough. <laughs> Just um, before we get into this, what happened to the old school? Well, the last class was in 1966. Now, I worked there as a custodian from 1959 to 1962. And if you want to read the book and about the ghosts that lived in the school, it's all in the book. I'm not going to talk about that. But in 1960, with you up there? I'm sorry? Don? Yes, he came in after me. He came in after right. Me. Uh, Don Ott. He took my place. And maybe the ghosts were kinder to him than they were to me. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, in 1966 was the last class. And uh, I might mention the last. Uh, the principal, last principal, was David Taylor. He was the first male principal of the Panola Hercules School also. And the last class had 495 pupils in it at that time, 7th and 8th grade. When I went there, I went there from kindergarten through 5th grade. Or, I'm sorry, kindergarten through 4th grade. Then Collins School had opened in 1950. So I went from 5th grade to 6th grade down to Collins School, and then back up to the old school for 7th and 8th grade. And by the 1960s, it had become a junior high school. And uh, the valley was just building homes like crazy, and kids were pouring into the school. So 
1966 was the last year of the school, and by then, in uh, 1965, the Richmond Unified School District Pinole was forced to give up the Pinole Hercules Union School District to the Richmond Unified School District to become part of it, and that ended the Pinole Hercules School District at that time, and they weren't interested in the old school except, you know, it was something to be torn down, so they said, oh, earthquake danger, earthquake danger. Uh, that place didn't even move during the 1906 earthquake. It was so well built. By the way, carpenters at that time made $4 an hour working at the school back then. Um, so in 1968, the school was demolished and torn down. So all that's left really are the memories of the school and the bell. Uh, but it was a wonderful place to be uh, and a good time of many good times of your lives were held there. These are, these are teachers of the 50s now. When I was uh, in school in the seventh and eighth grade, these are some of the teachers here. This is Irene Martin. She was the principal then at that time. That's John J. Lynch. He was the assistant superintendent. Uh, this is uh, Ms. Mellencourt. And this is Ms. Easton. Some of you had her. Uh, this is the teacher. <laughs> well, it's not one of my favorite teachers. Uh, Ms. Pagetto is Ms. Pagetto here. No, I, I have nothing against Ms. Pagetto. She was a, a great teacher, I guess, but in the seventh grade, I got shot in the eye. And I, was, I had to leave school, and I was in the hospital for a long time. I was getting an A in science, okay? What does she do? You know, to help me in my recovery, she gives me a D. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's the last thing. But there's Mrs. Classic is here, I believe. But these are the teachers uh, of the 50s in Pinole School. Um, I just want to uh, uh, talk a little bit in the declining moments about uh, some of the activities and some of the teachers. Because you, you can't, the, the schools of Pinole are connected to the teachers of Pinole, the teachers are connected to the school. The school and teachers are connected community. Um, when you read the book, you'll realize that, that these three schools, each one grew out of the other because Pinole was overpopulated and needed a bigger, bigger school every time. Carolyn Jordan spent uh, 41 years teaching at Pinole Hercules School Number 1. She was one of the favorite of uh, all teachers at the school. She was an eighth grade teacher. She passed away in 1960. But she loved kids and she loved sports. She had a booming voice. She had asthma. I remember she had asthma very badly. I remember um, she was the umpire one time in a baseball game we had. And uh, she thought I'd said something bad when I struck out. And I didn't. But she threw me out of the game anyway. <laughs> I said shucks. And she thought I said something else. So. Anyway, uh, Carolyn Jordan was one of the favorites uh, of the old school family. And uh, her name was uh, Carolyn Hansen. And then Carolyn, uh, later on, became Carolyn Jordan. She taught there a long time. Uh, CJ 8th, you put it in your paper. CJ, Carolyn Jordan, 8th grade. You were proud to do it. And uh, Miss Jordan loved sports. She loved history. Uh, she had her little session she'd read to us all the time. Remember, she read Heidi to us. Um, she had a Civil War sword hanging uh, over her in our classroom, a Civil War sword hanging. She loved history, especially Zane Gray stories. She'd always talk about Zane Gray. She, she was from Tuolumne County. She, she loved uh, anything to do with history. So this is one of the favorite teachers. Now, another teacher was Margaret Collins. I have to speak a, a bit about Margaret Collins. I don't have a picture to show you here. Margaret Collins was a third grade teacher at the old school in Pinole. She was an honor student at the old Plaza School. She became the third grade teacher then in 1940, Miss Ellahorse retired, and Margaret Collins took over as the principal of Pinole Hercules School Number One. Uh, she served as the principal from 1940 to 1967 when she retired, and that's when the Richmond School District took over the Pinole Hercules Union School District. Um, she was uh, quite a person. Uh, she was uh, superintendent of schools. She became a superintendent of the uh, Pinole Hercules Union School District, and uh, she had a Back in those days, the store to go to girls was I Magnets, right? There was Joseph Magnets, but there was I Magnets. And Margaret Collins, she had a beautiful green coat that she bought at I Magnets, and she would always throw that coat open to show you that label. <laughs> <laughs> she, was a, she was a wonderful person, and 
Um, we had a retirement dinner for in 1967 at the, uh, <clears throat> uh, at the Richmond Country Club. And uh, she retired at that time. And uh, so I have to mention Margaret Collins. Was she related to John? And, and yes. She was a, uh, that was their aunt, John's aunt. Yeah. And the lawyer. Robert. Yes, that was, a, that was her brother, one of her brothers. And um, I have to mention, uh, before I get into the last part of the reunion here, uh, crimes and punishment at the old school. <laughs> I mean, if you went to the old school, you knew it was going to happen to you sooner or later. Didn't matter. Someone's going to tell on you, or you were going to misstep in some way. It was going to befall you. What was going to befall you? Well, first of all, all the horrible childhood tortures that awaited you. Pinching. Oh, I hated that. Teachers would pinch you. Ear pulls. Oh, God. Ear pulls. Back thumps. Huh? Shakings. Ms. Beavers loved this one. Yeah. Shakings. And then um, Ms. Mc Mrs. McCune, she was seventh grade teacher. She had that awful three second <laughs> stare down, just psychological meltdown. It was just meltdown. <laughs> but the worst things of all happened a lot. There was a lot of physical conflict. I talked to one girl who in the eighth grade was horrified because her teacher, I won't mention the teacher's name, was chasing this big boy around the classroom with a broom, trying to hit him with it. And she thought, oh my god, I'm going to be next. You know? <laughs> this other girl dared to wear lipstick to class. Eighth grade girl. Teacher said, don't you come back tomorrow with lipstick. Next day, the girl had lipstick. Grabbed her by the head, teacher did, took her in the girl's restroom, and scrubbed her lips of color. Uh, there were a lot of other things too. Lizzie Stewart, one of the one of the uh, students, remember her ripping the buttons off a boy's shirt. Ah, the stair wars battle, I call them. Not Star Wars, but stair wars. The <laughs> stairs leading up to the upper deck were the sound <laughs> places of gladiatorial combat between teachers and students. I watched Irene Martin struggle at the top of the boy named Jimmy. And down they went, both of them, down, down, bang, bang, down, oh my God, okay? Uh, Miss Jordan one time, this big, big galoot from Panol boy, you know, must have been held back for five years or so. He knocked her down the stairs, just knocked her down the stairs. And she went all the way down the bottom. She picked herself up, walked up the stairs, and she showed him who was boss. She, she didn't take that from anybody. And other old timers remember uh, uh, fights on the stairs with the teacher's beads flying all over the place. So uh, if you buy the book, you'll find out of a lot of other things that went on at the school at the time. Uh, <clears throat> I, I might mention also, I forgot uh, Miss Beavers. Um, I have to mention Miss Beavers, she's my second grade teacher. There was more shaking going on than during an earthquake, one of the students remembered. Okay. I, I remember once, I don't know why I did it, because my mother was a teacher and I knew she was going to tell my mother, which was the worst thing of all. I had a little piece of paper with a spelling word between my legs. <laughs> you know, how stupid of me, because you, know, you knew she could see everything. She came up behind me, she grabbed me, and if you remember what the cloakroom was like, they would take you into the cloakroom and work you over. <laughs> and then you were put there, isolated in the cloakroom. The only good thing was you got to go through the other kids' lunches. <laughs> that was the only good thing. But uh, yeah, Mrs. Beavers would do that. And then do you remember Miss Alice, this little black stick you were talking about? Yeah, Miss Alice Oliver has a little black stick in the first grade. And if your fingers weren't clean, nails, knuckles, You got hit with this stick. When oh, when you're writing. writing. Okay. And I, I remember you couldn't be right hand, uh, left handed either, because my sister went in there left handed and she came out right handed. <laughs> <laughs> At the time. <coughs> well, uh, anyway, just to close things, yes.
we all came up here from, a, from elsewhere. Okay, yeah, I think yeah. The, that was during the 40s, uh, late 40s. Uh, the school was tremendously overcrowded. Yeah, there was, uh, there was some 400 children, and, and the classes had 50, 60 kids in a class during the war years. Yeah, I have that in the book. I just, I just want to, rem uh, to mention now, the uh, old school reunion, this was a, one of the uh, programs, and we have so many people to, to thank for putting on the reunions. You're one of the ladies who put on the reunion? Who's Davis? Why don't you stand, would you stand up if you were putting the reunion on or had put one of the ones in the past? Or, you don't have to stand. Yeah, thank you. Well, we have these folks to thank because the first reunion was held 12 years later in 1980. It was held at the Galileo Club, April Saturday, April 11th, 1980. 500 alumni showed up from all over the country for cocktails, dinner, dancing, and fun reunions. And Margaret Collins was sick. She couldn't attend. But they were asked to write a memory on a piece of paper. and. Selma Green, uh, Greenstein wrote, or Bea, Bea Greenstein, Selma, pardon me, wrote on a piece of paper, she wrote, Dear Miss Collins, still the best teacher ever. And of interest is the oldest alumnus that came to that reunion was Annie O'Neill. Now, in 1909, the Pinole Hercules School District hired Annie O'Neill, she was 19, to be the census marshal to make sure kids got to school or they got fined or their parents were thrown in jail. Um, $25 a month she made and then she was still alive and came to the 1980 reunion. She was 90 years old. Uh, Annie O'Neill, I'm, I'm McDonald I think was her last name from Reno, Nevada. So, today what we have left of the old school is the bell. And I want to read to you what's uh, on the bell at Collins School. We dedicated the bell January 25th, 2014. Uh, Selma Riskin, Selma Greenstein Riskin, the oldest alumnus, was there. Time, and this is what the bell says. The, there's a plaque by the bell. It says, this beloved bell is all that remains of the Pinole Hercules School, the school on the hill, atop Samuel Street. The school proudly served the Pinole Hercules communities from 1906 until 1966. Each morning, the school rang to class generations of local students. And we're all proud to be alumni of that old school. We don't want it to be forgotten. Ah, and there is the bell. This is the bell at... Uh, I, don't, I don't have any uh, the updated program. That's okay. This, this is the bell rusting at Pinole Middle School. Pinole, when the school closed in 1966, they built the new Pinole Junior High in 1967, which is Pinole Middle School today on Apian Way. But the bell was just rusting to pieces in the courtyard until it was rescued. And uh, most of the kids then didn't even know what the bell was for. So that kind of concludes uh, about the school. If anyone has any questions in particular I can help with, uh, I know these folks that went to the school have a lot more memories. Uh, if you read the book, you'll, there's a lot of memory flow in there of people that went to the school. Yes. I'm George. Uh, I was wondering if you know anything about, in terms of the earlier schools, like um, was it you, like a five-day school week, or was it more or less? Or, uh, the five days. And, yeah. And like the hours and that sort of thing. Um, Usually started around eight, eight to uh, three. Um, most most of the time, I believe. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's Margaret Collins at a retirement dinner in 1967. Who's this? Kitty Beavers. That's Miss Beavers, the earth shaker. Oh, she said. Miss Beavers liked to drink. She and my mom, when they got together, uh, they, they would talk Irish and drink Irish. Yeah. 
Uh, do you remember this lady? Mrs. Littman. Ms. Littman, yes, yeah. And this lady? Miss Maloney. Maloney. Yeah, first grade teacher. Yeah, this, this is murderer's row right here, these two. Um, <laughs> but you know, Miss Collins also had her way. Just a, an aside, one day she found out on a Monday that a little boy in the fourth grade had thrown a rock during the weekend and hit one of the girls in her room. So she went and got the fourth grade boy, she was teaching third grade at the time, and brought him into the cloakroom and gave him lessons on why he should not throw rocks at little girls. <laughs> now if you were taken in the cloakroom, you knew what to expect. Okay, the doors would rock. Was it you? 